unlike the current minimalism of choice, Soviet minimalism was a forced behavior pattern that was practiced in every Khrushchevka apartment and beyond. It was the time of total deficit of everything when connections sometimes were valued even more than money. People tried to stretch everything that they owned as much as they could as there was very little chance for impulse purchases. Hey my friends, if you're new here, I'm Anna and this is my channel about everything that is mindful, minimalist and creative. And today I want to share with you some of the uh, inventive and funny curiosities that I discovered in my childhood memories of um, minimalist Soviet lifestyle. Today I'm filming in my parents' apartment. so. It has seen almost no renovation um, and obviously no decluttering at all, so it will be interesting to see what we can find here. When considering Soviet minimalism, there were two essential must-haves for grocery shopping. The first one is called avoyska. It's a very lightweight and lacy bag that, uh, although exposed to everything, that you were lucky or not that lucky to purchase. And uh, interestingly, this very avoyska was gifted to me by a friend, and I guess it was actually made in France, if I'm not mistaken, and I haven't found any of the Soviet-style avoyskas here. And the name of, of this item, Avoyska, is very interesting because it's de it is derived from a Russian word Avois, which is pretty hard to translate, but can be... So it means something like counting or on a miracle or let's chance it. So it's a pretty brilliant naming. <laughs> and the second item that I wanted to show you, and I actually found it, uh, it's a metal vessel, here it is, <laughs> here you can see the design, so it's pretty iconic. It's called bidon, or uh, I guess it's a French word, bidon or something, I'm sorry my French friends. <laughs> so, and it was used for carrying all kinds of fluids, like for safely carrying them back home. Those fluids such as like milk and Quas were sold on tap from special tanks. And I was always horrified by those tanks because there was an urban legend that those tanks were never washed and therefore they were all layered with worms inside of them. So yeah, it's a pretty horrible <laughs> urban legend. Yeah, so, but this is bidon, so you can see the inside, yeah. With nearly no plastic stuff available, we reused every vessel that we could find. So all types of glass jars were filled with soups, pickles, jams, and some other substances that you don't even want to know. And I'm talking about um, um, some regular medical tests. So uh, yeah, we used some glass jars from baby food for that. Yeah, because there were there were no disposable plastic plastic vessels. Yeah, and uh, those bottles, such as like uh, juice bottles or beer beer bottles that were uh, that could hardly be reused, were recycled. And us kids, like Soviet kids, had the privilege of uh, collecting all those bottles and getting, um, bringing them to those recycling points and getting like small sums of money for that. I remember that my cousin and I were so happy to have our extra pocket money that we could spend on bubble gum. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, zero waste in practice. We cooked almost everything from scratch and such food preservation techniques as pickling, salting and drying were huge. Also, uh, almost every Soviet family had a, a family in the countryside or had a dacha, which is like a garden and a small cabin, and used 
that piece of land for growing their own food. So we grew potatoes, carrots, beets, cabbage, beans, I don't know, anything. And as a kid, I didn't know anyone who wasn't recruited by their family for potato weekend, so for digging and processing all those garden stuff. In, in winter, the uh, passion for planting was satisfied by growing spring onions on the windowsill in glass jars. And together with rye bread and salt, those spring onions were one of the best treats ever. Honestly, I don't remember that Soviet thrift stores were useful or popular because anyways they sell they sold everything that we already had so there was no point in it at all but at times we were lucky enough to get access to the so-called centers of humanitarian aid with piles of clothes like secondhand clothes that that were donated from people by people from the west it was pure textile magic. And I remember how a couple of times my cousin and I found some little coins in the pockets of our new garments. And I could phys physically feel the connection to a person that had been using that item before me. So it was, yeah, it was a very special moment. New items were bought very rarely and adored enormously. Each item had a special, unique character, a story behind, and was cherished throughout its life cycle. And the quality was super high, too. This is me in my early 30s wearing a Yugoslavian wool coat that my aunt managed to buy in the 70s. Throughout the 90s, it was used as a uniform for potato digging sessions until I found it. I remember us having the most sustainable and cruelty-free wool production ever. So we used pet hair or uh, fur from our Pusha the cat and Chipa the dog. They had to be combed for several weeks or even, or even months to collect all that amount of hair and fur. Then we would give it to um, a special skilled lady who would spin it into yarn. And then my mother and grandmother used that yarn to knit mittens and socks and special belts to reduce back pain that was uh, very frequent after the potato digging sessions. Mending and repurposing were like the major pillars of Soviet minimalism. For example, I haven't owned a fur coat or a four fur coat of my own until I was maybe 18. And the ones before that were remade from my mother's and my aunt's. But even then it was not the end of their lives, of those garments, I mean, because almost every kid's fur coat was destined to reincarnate in the form of a fur insole. Now it seems obvious that the less you own, the more creative your mind becomes. And with the excessive availability of everything, you fall into sort of a consumerist coma. But of course, back then we were not philosophical about the whole situation we were in. There were no plain sofas or armchairs in a Soviet apartment. Everything had to be convertible, like foldable and unfoldable. And during the holidays, our tiny apartment could be stuffed with a significant amount of Soviets. So that's why everybody needed their own sleeping place. And for those purposes, Raskladushka was used. So Raskladushka is basically a camp bed that is usually used in the army or in emergency situations. But in the Soviet years, they were the dream or nightmare catchers for many generations of Soviet citizens. And I remember my own experience, experiences <laughs> with sleeping on that type of bed. Um, and they were pretty horrible and painful, <laughs> I should admit. 
But yeah, sometimes people would even travel to other cities with their own raskladushka in order to make sure that they have a cozy nest to sleep in. A sign of good education and taste, home library was obligatory for almost every Soviet family. Even my grandparents in the deepest countryside had quite a significant collection of books. While not speaking about like this one, the amount of books that I have here that um, my father had been collecting over the years, and I still have no idea what to do with all these all these books and the funny thing is that some of them haven't been even read not even once and you can tell it by the special sound that the book produces when being open yeah for example i found this one so it's um latin american literature and listen oh the microphone is here yeah so you can you can hear it that is it has never been read and it was published in 1989 yeah so design is pretty cool though the spirit of inventive using and reusing of everything was just paramount. For example, women would spit into their mascara boxes in order to prevent mascara from drying. And I have no idea how those magical properties of saliva were discovered. Oh, and speaking of mascara, so I told you that there was no decluttering in this apartment. And look what I found in my mother's drawer. So yeah, it's... Um, authentic Soviet mascara box. This is how it looked. Yeah, I will show you. This is how it looked. And two brushes, like plastic ones. Yeah, it's super authentic. It's called, yeah, Leningrad. <laughs> yeah, then also uh, women, when the lipstick was coming to an end, women would collect those remnants of lipstick from uh, different tubes and heat them up in a small vessel and then cool it down and use it again. Also, a humble, a humble box of matches was used for many different tasks. For example, for deodorizing, the bathroom for making cotton swabs or toothpicks. Yeah. Please feel free to share in the comments other amazing old school hacks that you maybe grew up with. Of course, in my childhood, I perceived this forced minimalism as a fun game or extended adventure because I didn't know a life that was somehow different. But now I'm trying to make it an intentional journey of owning less and fewer things. And I'm trying to make it a joy instead of a burden. People here say you cannot earn all the money in the world, but I would rather put it like you cannot own all the stuff in the world. And right now, minimalism seems the only way to combat global clutterization and to get more connected with people on much deeper matters. Minimalism is the unforced freedom of behavior that many of us haven't felt for many, many years. And by us, I mean all people, everyone who is watching this and maybe feels the same connection that I first felt in my childhood looking at the foreign coin in my hand. This is it for today, my friends. Thank you so much for watching this video till the end. I hope you enjoyed it and please let me know in the comments what you think and maybe share some of the minimalist practices that were present in your families when you grew up or maybe you want me to tell you more stories about like this apartment and maybe some things here because 
it is like this place is oozing histories and different stories and Soviet artifacts. So just let me know. And you be safe, my dear friends, and enjoy your lovely day. And I will see you soon. Пока-пока.